The very first time I tried tying my own flies was a terrible experience. I was overwhelmed, I was confused, and a main contributor was hooks. You've got a bunch of different brands. You've got tons of different sizes. You've got model number 5262 over here and R5094840 over here. Yes, those are real model numbers. You've got different shapes. You've got different colors. Whew. It's tough. But don't worry, today we're going to work through it and we're going to clarify things. My name is Alex and I'm part of the team here at Ventures Flyco and this is module three of our beginner fly tying masterclass. This module is all about fly tying materials. We're gonna sift through the mountains of hooks, beads, feathers, and foam and help you develop a base understanding of each. Today, you might have guessed it, we're gonna talk all about hooks and specifically, we're gonna talk about the five fundamentals of fly tying hooks. Let's dive in. All right, so fundamental number one. We're gonna talk about the anatomy of a hook. This is important as a beginner because as you're watching those video tutorials or checking out any books that have fly tying recipes, they're going to be referencing different parts of the hook. And so we need to understand each of those elements. So first is the eye of the hook. This is that front loop. It's where you attach that tippet to your fly when you're out there on the river fishing. Next is the shank. This is the straight part of the hook from the eye back to the bend. Now, usually like in this picture, it's straight, but sometimes we have curved nymph hooks or stimulator hooks where the shank is actually curved. Next is the bend. This goes from where the shank starts to curve all the way to the point. Next is the gap. Sometimes you'll hear it called the gape. This is the space from the shank to the point of the hook. And then the sharp part of the hook is called the point. And then you've got a smaller point that's angled in the opposite direction. This is called a barb. Now there are barbed and barbless hooks, so this is optional. Now that we're more familiar with the anatomy of a hook, let's dive into fundamental number two, the hook sizing system. Now, if you've been fly fishing for a while, you're probably pretty familiar with this, but it's worth reviewing. We've got smaller hooks and we've got bigger hooks. A hook size is determined by an even number. And the bigger that number, the smaller the hook. The smaller the number, the bigger the hook. So that itty bitty size 22 hook on the left is much smaller than that size two streamer hook on the right. Okay, fundamental number three, hook characteristics. There's a bunch of different hook brands. There's a bunch of different model numbers. And what makes these hooks different is their characteristics. So we're gonna run through the seven different characteristics that make each hook different. So you can see here in this picture, we have a standard length hook, but you can have longer hooks signified by XL or shorter hooks signified by XS. And so nothing else about this hook is changing, just the shank length. So you can see at the top, we have one XL, two XL, three XL, and then at the bottom, you have one XS and two XS. All right, our next characteristic is wire gauge. So you can have your standard wire gauge or you can have extra fine and extra heavy. So extra fine is signified by XF, extra heavy, XH. And you can see in this picture that the diameter of the wire, that gauge, is much smaller in the extra fine and bigger in the extra heavy. And so you can imagine that your dry fly, you want it as light as possible because it's floating on the water surface. So most dry fly hooks are made of that extra fine wire gauge. And then nymphs and streamers, you want them to sink faster. So they're usually made of that extra heavy wire gauge. All right, next is gap width. So on the top, we've got our standard gap and on the bottom, we've got a wide gap hook. This is used for patterns that use a little bit more material than others, which if tied on a normal hook would obstruct that gap and make it harder to hook into fish. So instead you tie it on a wide gap hook, leaving plenty of room to hook that fish. Next is eye direction. 
This is pretty simple. The hook can be oriented in three different ways. Down, straight, or up. This is gonna play a role in the motion of the fly under the water surface or how it sits on top of the water surface. All right, next is barbed versus barbless. So as we mentioned before, the barb is that little point that's angled in the opposite direction, and it works. It definitely makes it harder for that hook to come out when you're fighting a fish. But each hook model usually has a barbless equivalent, and I would say it's generally accepted among the fly fishing community that barbless is the way to go. It makes it easier on the fish, and it makes it way easier to get the hook out when you're practicing catch and release. All right, the next characteristic is shape. So here we've got our standard hook shape. You've got that straight shank, the bend, the point, but you've also got hooks like this. This is a curved nymph hook. So the shank isn't completely straight. This hook is generally used for patterns like midges or scuds or emergers. And then here you've got a jig hook. The way this hook is shaped actually causes the fly to ride with its point facing up as opposed to down while it's traveling through the water. And so shape is an area where things get a little bit crazy. You can find tons and tons of different hook shapes. Their uses are far and few between. So as a beginner, we're just gonna focus on the standard curved and jig hooks. And then our last characteristic, color. So the two main colors you'll find are bronze and black nickel. Most of the standard hooks are gonna be bronze and a lot of those jig Euro style hooks are often black nickel. I'd argue that color's more about making your flies look good and showing them off to your buddies more than it is about actually catching fish. So that's the end of our hook characteristics. Now we're gonna dive into fundamental number four. So hooks and flies usually fall into four main categories. You've got your dry flies, you've got your nymphs, you've got your streamers. And the last one could be a subcategory of nymphs, but they're unique enough that they deserve their own category. And that is Euro or competition nymphs. So when we're talking about dry fly hooks, they're usually a little bit longer because you need more room for all the materials. And then like we talked about earlier, it's usually that extra fine wire so that it can flow easier. And they usually have a down eye orientation so that it sits naturally on the water surface. And then nymphs are usually heavier wire so that they can sink easier. You'll find nymph hooks in both down and straight eye orientations. And like we talked about earlier, they can either have that standard or curved shape. For streamers, we start getting into those really long hooks. The XL, the 2XL, the 3XL, and then they usually have that heavier wire so that they can sink faster and so that they're stronger. And most of the time you find them in down or straight eye orientations. And then those Euro or competition nymphs, they're usually barbless, they're that jig style, and they have that black nickel finish. Now, just as a disclaimer, these are just general trends. There are no hard set rules in fly tying. For example, you can use a dry fly hook to tie up a nymph. All right, we're almost there. You've made it to fundamental number five, model numbering systems. I would say this is where the majority of confusion and struggles come for beginner fly tires. That's because every company is different. For example, here are a bunch of standard dry fly hooks. As you can see, every single one is a little bit different, whether it's the gap width, or the shank length. And so when I buy that standard dry fly hook from one company and I run out of those and I go back to the store, those are out of stock. So I decide to go with another brand. Those hooks, they're probably still gonna work great, but they're gonna be slightly different from the last one you had. And if that doesn't make things difficult, you ain't seen nothing yet. Let's talk about the model numbering nightmare. So like I said, these are all standard dry fly hooks but here we've got the TMC 100, the Orvis 4864, the Daiichi 1170, the MFC 7000, and then my personal favorite model numbering system, the Mustad R50-94840. It definitely seems like the numbering systems were made for the engineers that created these hooks rather than us anglers that use them. But it is what it is and we've just got to deal with it as fly tires. So 
especially as a beginner, don't worry too much about it. Just a little bit of friendly advice, take it slow. Understanding that a TMC 100 is a dry fly hook, a TMC 5262 is a nymph or a streamer hook, a TMC 5212 is a terrestrial hook. That's gonna come with time, that's gonna come with tying with that hook consistently. And so as you're starting out, focus on the characteristics. Most of the time on that hook package, you're gonna be able to see what that length is, what that gauge is, what that gap width is, the eye direction, if it's barbed or barbless. And so knowing those exact characteristics that you want, the model number actually becomes irrelevant. And then stick with one brand at first and expand over time with personal needs or preferences. And that's because comparing hook models and categories and characteristics between a single company is much easier than going out and trying to compare three different companies' dry fly hooks, kind of like we did earlier. And just be aware that everyone has their own opinion, especially in the fly tying world. Some people will only use their Tiemco hook. Some people will only use Daiichi. Some people will only use Mustad. But understanding which hooks you like and your own personal preferences, that's gonna come with time. You did it. You made it through all five of the fly tying hook fundamentals. Now, we don't expect you to be an expert right off the bat, that's gonna come with time, but we do hope you found this helpful. In the next section, we're gonna cover and clarify another topic that causes fly tires heartburn, and that's thread. It's gonna be a good one, so check it out right here.